Watch this. We knew this was coming, and now Idaho will have to defend its transgender athlete law in court. We're going to hear from the woman behind the lawsuit. How's the COVID crisis affecting Boise's homeless population? Well, the city has set aside an entire hotel to help. He used to make sure Idaho's capital flagpoles were painted perfectly. So what's this steeplejack up to now? We check in on a 208 redial. Kind of lost in the COVID shuffle these last couple of weeks. The fact that Idaho became the first state to ban transgender athletes from joining teams in which they identify. We followed the legislation closely here on the 208 from before it was introduced by Representative Barbara Ehart to when House Bill 500 was signed into law by Governor Brad Little. That was March 30th, while we were right in the middle of our first week under a stay at home order. We knew then what was likely to happen, and Idaho's chapter of the ACLU wasted no time with their tweet. See you in court. Well, court could be the next step because the ACLU, on behalf of a Boise transgender athlete, has officially filed a petition in federal court. Today, Joe Paris spoke with Lindsay Hecox, the transgender woman who wants to run for BSU, and her legal team about how they hope to at least get her the chance. I'm a trans student athlete at Boise State, and I would love to run as female on the cross country team there. Unfortunately for Lindsay Hecox, though, Idaho Governor Brad Little signed House Bill 500 into law a few weeks back. That legislation was sponsored by Representative Barbara Ehart. During the session, she explained why she thought it needed to be a law. We cannot physically compete with men. This is all strictly about sports. We can change our outside appearances, but we don't in inherently change who we are physically with the DNA encoded in our bodies. So to be clear, that bill now makes it against the law in Idaho for a trans woman like Lindsay to run on a women's collegiate team. What message did that send to you? It was a discriminatory message. They don't care about us at all. So Lindsay and the ACLU filed paperwork in federal court challenging the legality of the law. The goal? Hopefully take it down with preliminary injunction before the season starts so I have a chance to run. Well, uh, discrimination against trans folks is unconstitutional. We already know that. Richie Epping, legal director for the ACLU Idaho, says the bill and a possible lawsuit has been on their radar for a while. Well, we've been fighting this bill since the day it was introduced in the legislature. The bill is a constitutional nightmare. So we've brought several constitutional challenges to the bill, including the fact that it violates the Equal Protection Clause, uh, both because it's discrimination against all women and girls and because it's wholesale uh, bar on the participation by trans women and girls in student athletics. Every single trans person will feel more threatened by the fact that their legislature has visibly shown discrimination towards them. The ACLU knows that like past legal challenges to Idaho laws, the case will likely be a very expensive one all around. It's going to unfortunately cost the Idaho taxpayers, which the legislator the legislature um, showed very little concern about and has shown very little concern about in the past. Lindsay says for her, though, it's about fighting for what she believes in, equality. My gender doesn't really have anything to do with it. I just want to run. I know that this is right. It's something that I have to do. This lawsuit discriminates against me and so many others. And Joe, there is, or Lindsay isn't the only one, only athlete involved in this case. There's another one, isn't there? That's right, Brian. There is actually a cisgender athlete who is a high school student in the Boise School District, and they're part of this lawsuit as well. They're unnamed because they're under 18. They're a 17-year-old. They're not a transgender athlete, though, but they're concerned with the exam portion of House Bill 500. If you've missed this, there is a challenge aspect to House Bill 500 in the event that Someone is questioning if an athlete is transgender or cisgender. And so there are plenty of cisgender athletes, Brian, according to the ACLU, that have a problem with House Bill 500, not even because they're transgender, but they don't want to be part of any type of inspection to prove their gender. That's been a big issue for a lot of people is then having to been forced then to prove that they are a boy or a girl and playing on that respective team. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. Well, it's been estimated by people who count this kind of thing, and you heard Joe talk about it. Defending a lawsuit like this could run more than a million dollars. 
It's also been speculated that Alliance Defending Freedom, the organization that helped Representative Ehart write this bill, well, they would help cover those costs. So I asked the Arizona-based, Christian-based legal group if they, in fact, would be carrying the costs of this court case. This was their response. As a leading authority on constitutional law, Alliance Defending Freedom is frequently asked by legislators and legislative bodies to provide legal analysis and insight on pending issues and legislation. We were honored to assist Idaho legislators in their effort to protect women's athletic opportunities in the state. That's from Matt Sharp, as you can see there. That's the senior counsel. So I asked for clarification on that because that's a lot of words, not exactly a full throated yes, but that was all I received. Honored to assist Idaho, which isn't unusual. Often special interest groups will provide attorneys to assist in the defense of a lawsuit. They would be recognized by the state's attorney general as a friend of the court, and they would basically write up the briefs, come up with the entire defense argument, and the attorney general would then just sign off on it. Our attorney general, however, has already signed off on a brief saying that this law, House Bill 500, will not be easy to defend. All right, we're looking at new COVID-19 numbers. I'm thinking it's uh, we're up to 15. Uh, just let me check these numbers here. Yes, 1531 with 41 deaths. So those are the latest numbers when it comes to COVID-19. We often hear about a lot of people that are kind of in this compromised position, the elderly, those with underlying underlying medical conditions who are mo more susceptible to COVID-19. But there is another very vulnerable population that's not really gotten a lot of our attention these days. We've certainly been asked about it, though. How is this affecting Idaho's homeless community? Here's Kim Fields. Words of encouragement hang from the balconies at Cottonwood Suites in Boise. Soon, the empty hotel will be a refuge for our homeless community stricken by COVID-19. It's 106 rooms. We have leased the entire hotel, and that hotel will be where we can isolate, where we can quarantine people experiencing homelessness in Ada County. Anyone in the homeless community who's tested positive for COVID-19 will be placed at the hotel. So that we can make sure we're not exposing an entire shelter system. Maureen Brewer is with Our Path Home, the public-private partnership working to end homelessness in Ada County. She says the city of Boise will pay the $70,000 a month bill for the hotel with federal reimbursements to come. So the city is going to go ahead and front the cost of our emergency response to make sure that not only that our homeless population is protected to the best of our ability because they are at a higher risk for the virus, um, but also the community at large, that we're doing our part to uh, to flatten the curve. Also in place, a screening protocol at all homeless shelters in the area. When they check in and when we re-register people every evening, uh, we ask them how they're feeling. Uh, did I have any cough or shortness of breath? Uh, we check their temperatures. Reverend Bill Roscoe is with the Boise Rescue Mission. And I'm so happy to tell you, Kim, that as of right now, we've tested close to 40 people and we've not had one positive uh, COVID-19 test. The Homeless Coalition is also preparing for what they expect to be a second wave of the COVID-19 crisis. So we're just tracking unemployment rates and all those folks that were living paycheck to paycheck with a full-time job that maybe now are furloughed or unemployed and what that's going to look like in terms of needing to step in with rental assistance for homeless prevention. Brewer says emergency money for the CARES Act will help. We can rehouse families and households or individuals experiencing homelessness with those funds so get them off the street or out of the shelter into permanent housing and we can also do homeless prevention with those dollars. So we're working on that kind of mid to long term range plan right now. And the Boise Rescue Mission will be ready too, just as they have been for our community for 62 years now. We're just going to go back right back to business as usual and helping people make the process of recovering from homelessness. Um, and we, you know, we had capacity before this happened and we'll have capacity after it's over in order to take people uh, in and to help them get into programs of recovery. That hotel, by the way, has been empty since March 28th. We're also learning more about how the coronavirus is affecting those living in nursing homes or other long term care facilities in our state. Remember, it was a nursing home in Kirkland, Washington. That was the first cluster of COVID-19 cases in our nation. Well, here in Idaho, we haven't been hit nearly as hard, or at least it's been a little bit more spread out. As of Monday, there are 14 long term care facilities in Idaho that have had at least one confirmed case of COVID-19. 
either in a resident or a staff member. There have been a total of 58 residents and staff that have tested positive in these long term care facilities. 12 people who live there have died. The Department of Health and Welfare is not disclosing, though, the names of the facilities for privacy reasons. One potato, two potato, three million potatoes. Well, now they're almost down to none. These spuds vanish faster than a pack of two-ply at the grocery store. How'd I end up here? That's what this teacher from CUNA was wondering 15 years ago while he was fulfilling his family tradition and making some summer scratch hundreds of feet above the state capitol. It's a 208 redial. Don't dial this number, text it. Well, text something profound to it, something inquisitive to it, to us about something we've talked about or you want us to talk about. This is the number, 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name and the hashtag, the 208. We're going to read some of your texts coming up at the end of the show. And that's a big old pile of potatoes. Well, who'd have thought some video and a bunch of pictures of a big old pile of Idaho potatoes on the ground would generate so much interest online. But that's exactly what happened. Yesterday, we told you about Cranny Farms. It's an Oakley based potato farm that was giving away thousands and thousands and kind of millions, I think is what he said, rather than turning. They were giving them away rather than turning them into cattle food. Well, since then, we've seen a lot of questions about this story, like how many potatoes were in that original pile? When will they run out and has this helped business? So we asked Cranny Farm CEO Ryan Cranny for some answers and what's the last 24 hours been like? About 6,000 bags or 100 pound bags. I mean, it'd be several million individual potatoes. Continue to get a lot of traffic on Facebook, a lot of questions. People want to know if they're still there. I think it'll last through today and that's about it. If, if the traffic continues about the same. All right, so I want to show you now the latest potato pile picture. That's not it. That's from uh, yeah, there it is. It's still pretty impressive, though, and you can see why he means millions of individual potatoes, because that's still a pretty big pile. And he said he's seen a steady stream of people driving up to his farm in Oakley and just kind of filling up bags because they just can't get rid of them. So if you want to, well, take the drive to Oakley. <music> Thank you. 
Hey, just to show you that the temperature this afternoon with this wonderful sunshine for today warmed up to the mid 50s, which was pretty close to our forecast high for yesterday. Winds have been pretty much calm around the area. So here's a look at your high temperature for Boise. It's up to 54 degrees. You see many spots were just getting above 50 degrees for the high temperature this afternoon. And as we continue through tomorrow, anticipation of it to warm up. In fact, it could be popping up another 10 degrees or so, and then could go up another 5 to 10 degrees as we get into the weekend. So we'll take a look at some of these temperatures and what that means for us. First of all, if you look here, at the Northwest Satellite, we're clearing out there over most of the Northwest storm system from this morning is moving down into Denver. So that's pretty much moving away from us. And with that, we've got these warmer temperatures that are coming in from the West. Seattle and Portland today had high temperatures of 70 degrees. So highs for tomorrow will be getting somewhere in the mid 60s. That's your forecast. It's been seven score and 17 years since the Gettysburg Address, but in times like these, there's a shorter, almost as meaningful message being touted by our 16th president. Do you have some words of wisdom to share? Or how about some kernels of truth? Pearls of perspective? Whatever. Just text us at 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name. We're going to read some of your messages at the end of the show. All right, like most Idaho life stories, this one started with the question, I wonder, as in, I wonder who paints the flagpoles at the Idaho State House? Well, way back in August of 2004, I found out when I looked up and found Toby Anderson strapped to a pole on the Capitol's West Lawn. That pole, no longer there, but Toby still paints flagpoles, just not around here. Here's Toby in his Idaho prime from 15 summers ago for a 208 redial. All right, here we go again. Toby Anderson has spent his summer seeing the city like nobody else. Going up takes a while. <laughs> From the side of a flagpole. First summer doing it and uh, I'm loving it. Toby's a teacher at CUNA High School. <laughs> Only my students saw me. He wanted a summer job, 
just not a normal one. Working at a camp at the normal summer job. So he started his own company and called it Andy's uh, Steeplejack Flagpole Painting and Repair. Being a steeplejack has actually been the family business. Yeah, my uh, grandpa started it. Toby's dad continued it, and now Toby is keeping it going by keeping himself strapped to a steel staff. I always ask myself, why'd I do this? <laughs> it's a great view, that's why. Today's view. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. As seen from the state capitol. And this is the cream of the crop. This is the capitol building. It's supposed to be shiny and, and very uh, clean and sharp looking here. And I think doing these poles will definitely add to that. These poles and this pole out front and this pole on the west lawn. That was a lot higher. <laughs> That's more than 300 stately feet of shiny silver steel. You got to be more than 100 feet up there. See, that doesn't help hearing right now. <laughs> Once he makes it to the top, All right, that's as high as I can go. Toby paints his way down. Those are ozone friendly spray cans. Excellent. <laughs> Seeing as how you're so close to the ozone. <laughs> he may be the only person to get this close to this flagpole, but Toby takes pride in painting every inch. How's it look? He's not crazy. How you doing so far? Hanging in there. Literally. He's just a teacher. <laughs> it's awesome. I love it. Trying to supplement his salary. This job is going to buy me a riding lawnmower. One flagpole at a time. Oh, I feel so much safer. Brian Holmes. At least three feet more safer. Idaho's News Channel 7. Well, for the record, Toby got that riding lawnmower that summer. Paid 150 bucks for it. Well, then he sold it a couple years later when he moved to California. He didn't stop painting flagpoles, though, although he hasn't done it in a couple of years because he recently got married has been buying a house and settling into family life. But he still remembers that day in August when we hurt our necks looking up at him the whole time. Boy, I gave them a great deal on that flagpole at the Capitol <laughs> building on the West Lawn. I gave them a great deal. When I think about what I'm getting now, I'm like, I cannot believe I climbed 101 feet high and for eight hours and what I got paid was piddly squat. And <laughs> that's still the highest and I will never go that high again. That scared the living daylights out of me. You saw me. I kind of slipped. And I, I didn't ever tell you this, but that freaked me out so much. <laughs> So you're still teaching? Oh yeah, yeah. In my twenty uh, uh, second year now, and it's kind of odd doing it on the computer over here now for the next couple of weeks. You know, uh, actually, it's been four weeks now, and we'll finish out the school year this way. And I, I feel horrible for our, our seniors. You know, I love the Bay Area. There's so much diversity. Well, our school, we did a survey about three, four years ago, and now uh, forty four ethnicities in our one school that are represented. That is just, I love that. So you got a baby on the way. Yeah, uh, uh, May 21st. May 21st. Do you see yourself getting back out there in the steeplejack? Yes, yeah. yeah especially with the, our little fella on the way, it'd be nice to be able to have kind of a, a second income coming. So uh, if I can pull that off, and if it means, you know, going out on a Saturday and painting a pole or two, I got all the equipment right in the garage. <laughs> Well, Toby teaches life management classes at Milpitas High School, which is just outside of San Jose. Life management, things like how to be assertive and financially responsible, like maybe how to get a side job in case you want to buy some lawn equipment. We'll be right back.
Yeah, I know, kind of hard to keep track of time these days. They all kind of just run together, the days do. Seems like we've been in this together for what, four score and say seven years? All right, maybe not quite, but the man who made that reference famous, President Abraham Lincoln, wants us to know he's in it with us. And while this fight we're in isn't exactly the Civil War, and flatten the curve doesn't quite have the same ring as the opening lines of the Gettysburg Address, Honest Abe does have something to say to us during these trying times. This is what the Lincoln statue in Dooley Davis Park looked like this week, wrapped in a face mask. And on it was the written words, be smart, stay at home. Obviously, the person who wrote this isn't exactly a wordsmith like President Lincoln, but the message still carries some significant weight. Almost as valuable as that piece of fabric on his face right now. This COVID-19 crisis is certainly a test of our nation, and we will endure just like we did back then. So be like Lincoln and be smart. Stay home or at least cover your face. Well, parks like Julia Davis are still open. Not so much shopping centers like the village at Meridian. Remember when we used to be able to sit at a table and hang out in the courtyard, let the kids play on the playground, watch the fountain dance to the music? Well, for today's moment of COVID calm, we're taking you back. You can almost have the place to yourself. All right, wrapping up the 208 with a look at some of your comments you sent in during the show, starting with this one right here. When will all Idaho unemployment recipients receive $600 along with the unemployment benefits? There is a backlog right now, so that is kind of up in the air, but we're assured that if you did file and it's accepted, you'll get back pay on that if it doesn't come right away. So you will get it. It just may take a little bit of time. You only seem to interview athletes who oppose the state's transgender legislation. You ever tried to find any woman athlete who may think the law is a good idea? After all, women who lose scholarships to trans athletes might have an opinion. Well, Peter, here in the 208, there's never been 
an ad Idaho athlete who has lost out on a scholarship to a trans athlete. So no, we haven't because it's never happened here in the state of Idaho. Well, Governor Little concerns himself with pestering trans athletes. He vetoed legislation to compensate wrongly convicted inmates, which passed the legislature by one or all but one dissenting vote. Yes, he did uh, veto that leg or that law. He said it was to save the state money. How do we get potatoes for our family and where? We got to head southeast of here, south of Burley, about three hours.